Hello. Hiya. All right, we're switching it up and giving you more. Have you guys ever wondered what we were thinking while we we're sailing offshore? You're in luck. We just finished 1,000 nautical miles offshore in the Atlantic Ocean. So if you want the insider scoop, the behind the scenes, the real deal holy field, <laughs> then stay tuned. We're going to give you a little commentary about what was on our minds during the sail. And we're going into the ocean! If you want to see the videos without commentary, be sure to check the links in the description box below. But definitely stick around because we're going to talk about things that we did not share with you in the videos. You could say we were a little excited to get out back on the water. What do you mean we don't do this dance all the time? Uh, no. <laughs> we have been working on the boat for four months. So we were really itching to get out there. Along with the itching, I would say that there were some nerves. Yes. Because this sail was definitely gonna put all of that boat work to a test. These dredging machines reminded me of the smoke monster from Fern Gully. I don't know if you guys seen that cartoon, but. I don't remember it. <laughs> yeah, but just the noise that they were making was monstrous we had never seen dredging before had we not like this no this was we exited out of port canaveral on the trip to new england we were heading toward rhode island it was going to be a one straight shot and we were running from hurricanes yeah so this was hurricane season uh, so we were kind of nervous about what kind of weather we were going to get but I think this first day we really got lucky because we had wind and it was just so pretty out. Yeah. So you're probably wondering why would we leave in hurricane season? Well, we're just crazy Floridians. <laughs> so we're used to pushing that envelope. We had already seen a couple of hurricanes forming just off of Africa. So that means they have weeks before they would even get to the Caribbean or Florida. And with the power of the Gulf Stream, going north, we knew we would have some extra speed. Uh, plus, we had been paying attention to the weather patterns, and this seemed to be more of a lighter wind situation, which we felt a little more comfortable because we didn't see any um, storm, like just thunderstorm developments because of it. So that's why we picked this window. So the other option instead of going offshore would have been going up the intracoastal waterway, the ICW, as most people know it. But we really like being offshore. And we were on a time crunch. Uh, we were trying to get up to Newport because of the boat show. Yeah. So going up the ICW, we could only probably do about 30 to 50 miles a day. And that was going to take way too long for us um, because we we're running behind schedule. And also, um, you can't really catch mahi or tuna or even bonito. <laughs> <laughs> we caught a lot of bonito. Yes. Um, we have eaten bonito in the past, and a lot of people actually commented, why don't you eat bonito? Why don't you eat bonito? It's not bad. It's just we wanted to um, save our freezer space for tuna because yeah. we love tuna way better than bonito. Yeah. And... Thank you for those who did send us some recipes though, so we might try it out in the future. Yeah, there was a pickle recipe yeah. that looked pretty good. Yeah. We are super grateful for our friends Dave and Sarah and letting us stay on their dock. Yeah. We also got to use their oven and kitchen to do all of our prep for this trip. I spent one day doing it instead of three days, which was so nice. Yeah, having all that counter space and we only have a very limited amount of bowls and plates and yeah, cookware. So, you know, after making one meal, we got to clean it all and then redo, re dirty it again. Yeah, instead of using all the dishes and then using the dishwasher afterwards. <laughs> Kind of late, but I can't catch anything if you don't have anything out. We find the best time to fish. Actually, we didn't find this out for ourselves. <laughs> Our good fishing buddy Mike told us that the best times to fish are 
sunrise to about 9 10 a.m and then sunset so you know a couple like two hours before sunset and we try to have a lure out only during those times the rest of the time is kind of a waste we usually just collect seaweed however going into the gulf stream was nice because we did not find any gulf, any seaweed Oh, in the yeah, Caribbean that's, Sea. That's true. I didn't even really think about yeah. it. Yeah. It was really nice to actually fish because in the Caribbean, it's pretty difficult to keep your line out without it getting completely swamped by seaweed. Gotta love that Gulf Stream. It's pretty easy to get complacent while you're out offshore. Um, I tend to, so I need a, a swift kick in the ass to, to get moving. Uh, but we do constantly switch out sails to optimize how fast we're going. And this little thing that Bo's holding in his hand is a manual wind anometer. An anometer. Anometer. <laughs> Which I find is nice because at least it won't break on us. Yeah. I mean, the battery might run out. We're not getting the wind up at the mast, but that's not that big of a deal. We have a pretty short mast. Be too bad but it is pretty accurate and it helps us instead of guessing like so we used to do. Yeah. I think the good thing about going up this, this way, we were getting a lot of downwind. So we knew that we were, Sersha loves going downwind. Yeah, the autopilot hates the yeah, downwind. Yeah, she does pretty good downwind. Yeah. She really loves pointing. Yes, but I'm, I'm okay with not pointing. <laughs> you mean beating, beating into, into it? it? By this time, we did lose wind, but we made up enough ground to get out to the Gulf Stream. And we were really surprised at how fast we were moving with the Gulf Stream. I mean, I feel like I heard more bad things about being in the Gulf Stream than good things. Well, I think it's just, it depends on your weather window. Like, or just the weather that you get when you go out there, because you can predict all day long, but you know how predictions are. They're, they're never accurate. If I could take the Gulf Stream up north again, I definitely would, because we were going faster than what we normally would go under sail on our average. Yeah. That's crazy. It was insane and very enjoyable because we had that south wind. Yeah. A north wind, that would be nasty. Red sky at night, same as to light. <laughs> and something we always like to see, a red sky at night. However, I don't really know if it's true. I can't say we've ever keep track of it. No, I, yeah, I'm not it's sure. It's pretty. <laughs> yeah, it, that was a nice sky and you know the skies are always different yeah. just because of the different cloud coverage and stuff so somebody did point out that we had running lights at our bow and on the top of the mast yeah so that's my bad <laughs> i just wired it up wrong i need to wire it on separate switches that way we either pick one or the other for those who don't know when you are sailing you can have them above on your mast and they call that tri-light or below on the deck. Which is when you're under power. But if both of them... Then it's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> but, I didn't know why. I mean, me thing. personally, I kind of disagree with it because it's like, well, why wouldn't you want more lights to yeah. be more identifiable? But I guess because we're a small uh, pleasure craft, um, you're, you're only supposed watch. to have one set of lights. Mm. And then if you're under sail and in motor, so you have to have your I'll probably be up for another steam light on. Hours, if you're motoring at all ever, on. you have to have the steam light on. Oh, really? With uh, just your power just boat your lights. Just your power lights. Sky power boat lights, that's what they call them. Yeah, Still I guess your stars. deck lights. Mm. Uh, so we tiny clouds are always kind of very tentative on our sleep schedule, especially in the beginning. I think it takes like three days for us to really get into roll of things. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm, I guess, too nice <laughs> because I'll stay up as much as I can and let Brandy sleep as much as she can, which always backfires on him. Yeah, but actually we got lucky um, these couple nights. 
something. Yeah, because typically but, if I um, do that, then yeah. right when Brandy gets her shift and I'm like just about night. asleep, she has to wake me up because of a storm or a ship or something. Most of the time I feel like I get the late night shift, you get the super early morning, and then I get sunrise. Yeah, typically that happens. And then during the day, it's just a complete mashup. We don't stick to a schedule during the day. Maybe if we were doing longer passages. And But you're better at the... Um, the sunrises filming them and stuff mm. you know right. at least i think so i have to say that even though as great as our camera is it never picks up the colors of the sky at all of way we see them in our eyes well really anything we show you guys <laughs> it's only just it's eh. a fraction yeah you really like truly have to be out here and experience it to get the full feeling and the full feeling of nothingness just water surrounding this was a really nice sail because it was so quiet and leisurely and just with the gulf stream pushing us even though when we had no wind we were still going an amazing speed it was pretty chill because typically like right now Bo is sleeping and i'm not going to change sails without him because i we technically shouldn't be going up forward without anybody else we, being up. We have here and there, but yeah, we really should stick to that yeah. rule. We Even when it's dead like this. Yeah. I mean, of course, it's a little bit more safe, but... I would highly recommend getting one of these little sunshades because it's so versatile. We use this thing everywhere. Because it's perforated, we can sail without it having a lot of Wind, drag. Yeah. yeah. But we use it at anchor and stuff too, so. Yeah, actually Brandy configures it to make this massive wind scoop at anchor. People always ask, how do we do it without air conditioning? One, I have to say, since we have spent so much time in Florida, we were from here, and then in the Caribbean, our bodies are just acclimated to it. But with this ginormous wind scoop, it just pushes air all the way through. Now, we may not have to use it as much because we have these amazing windows that open up. These port lights, I should say. We just did a little grib download. For weather, we use an app called Luck Grib. It's a one-time fee, and then you can use it indefinitely, unlike some of the other subscription Way apps. more expensive. <laughs> yeah. And we use that in tandem with our Iridium Go. Uh, the Iridium Go is the actual satellite, the communication part of it, and the app is what grabs the weather grip. That way we have an idea of what to generally expect out there. What is a grip? Uh, I forget what that acronym stands for, but ba basically it's just a, a weather map. It just lets you see what the forecast is. Mm -hmm a more binary way of downloading it through the satellites? Yeah, it's it's like a compressed version of it. Rarely do we see seven knots on Sersha. Let alone almost eight <laughs> we saw there. <laughs> With barely any wind. <laughs> it's mind blowing how much the Gulf Stream was taking us. Yeah, the waves were so small. We were so lucky with this part of the passage that it just was glassy i mean look at the waves they're tiny yeah I, I think i mentioned this in the one of these videos but it seemed like we were sailing in protected waters like if we were in the icw yeah exactly here we go fishing again <laughs> there's nothing else to do out there <laughs> i feel as though this is the time right here that you embrace the easy Wind blowing in your hair, beautiful sunset, great waves, great wind direction. Yeah, because it's mostly not like this. Yeah, and we really want to document those times. I think it's a lot easier for us to document something like this than when stuff is going wrong or when shit's hitting the fan. We still, <laughs> we still try our best to, we do, to get that documented. Because though. we don't want to put out something that's untrue. Right, we don't want to give off the misconception that this life is easy, because it's not. It's it's a lot of work. But a it's, lot of the work is 
totally worth it. Yeah, oh yeah, 100%. Well, at least for us. Yeah. For us, we would not trade this life for anything. Absolutely not. The people that we've met, the places we've gone, the experiences we've had. The skills we've learned. All outweigh the crappy times. Yeah. You can have crappy times on land, in the sky, in the water. It doesn't matter. But this is why we're out here doing it. And it is true what they say. The highs are high and the lows are low. Super true. And yeah, filming all this does add complexity. But it's nice because we know we're creating this journal of our sailing life. The highs and lows. I want to remember all of it. Yeah, when we were wedding photographers, we took pictures of each other <laughs> and our our adventures but we did nothing with it it just sat on our computers yeah i saw this the other day electronic dust is what they called it oh that's yeah. a good analogy yeah and we have been asked i don't know many times on why do we post it to youtube because it keeps us accountable i mean honestly there's way better ways to make money while being out here than youtube and but I mean, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of these moments we could just sit and watch, but we, we have to make sure we have a camera to actually capture it. I am on the other side of that camp, though. I have always been, I've always wanted to share with people photography. So when people say, well, you should put the camera down and enjoy the, the scenery, that's never been me. I always feel bad that I don't have something to share with people. I don't know why. That's yeah, you're, just me. you're an includer. I am an includer. <laughs> she likes to include everybody. I have to say that this sale was so nice because it was so gentle. It was nice and easy to make coffee and not worry about things flying all over the place. It was just so smooth. It was very peaceful. Big shout out to Big Duck Canvas who helped supply these this fabric that's above my head that I, during that four months of boat work, created a new bim mini. It is gone through the ringer and held up very nicely. It's I, super waterproof. I think it looks amazing. I really like it, especially on the days that are like gloomy and there's just an extra pop pop of color. Yeah. Especially when you're standing behind in front of it. Looks nice with your eyes. My eyes? <laughs> yeah. Oh, jeez. I was talking about weather and how we had communications with uh, Dave, our buddy, and just with having satellite. I was thinking back to the days where they had nothing. They kind of just had to go. I'm sure there were people out there who knew the trade winds and the yada yadas, but now it's just so easy to get out there and go and not worry as much as I think people tend to do yeah and boats were built differently back then to accommodate that <laughs> very true they were built super robust but nowadays you know they're it's rare for you to hit weather like that yeah i mean and also we're not that far away from land i mean we're a day sail back to land if we really needed it so we're not in the middle of the pacific ocean where you really kind of helpless and a hurricane's coming your way and Good luck. In case you guys didn't know, Sersha is a 35 foot Pearson centerboard that was built in 1971. When we got her, she had a seized diesel, so we replaced it with an electric motor. The little lady put up the big deck. I've joked about our cockpit lockers and how much space we actually have. We can fit. Many, many, many bodies. We 100% in there. both can fit in there. Oh, easy. We can fit multiple people in there. Right now, I think we have four sails in there fabric, Isinglass, paint. Hardware. Yeah. We, in just one side. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. The way they were built back in the day were for racing, <laughs> and the rules back then kind of forced oh, this design. Yeah. Which is, I mean, if we use the outside more, it would be great. But it's just not something that we do because we don't have a full enclosure. We don't have a dodger. 
We've had barbecues with 13 people, and they all fit pretty comfortably. Yeah, uh, it, it fits a lot of people. It's definitely great for uh, a lot of people, but it's just not for both you and I. We don't need it. Yeah, it's rare that we have that many people on Sersha. Um, we'd much rather have that space inside the boat. Yeah. I honestly have no idea what other people do on their long sails because they don't have hank-ons to change often. Constantly. Yeah, we, uh, they probably just sit back and enjoy the ride. Uh -huh. Yeah. Maybe get bored a little bit? Probably. Yeah. We, and rarely do we even get a fold up the sails because it's usually kind of rough. <laughs> right, we just <laughs> pile them up and just throw them in the yeah. cockpit locker and deal with it later. On some of our sails, we've gotten a little smart and we'll put both sails up on the forestay in order for us to easily get up there and put it up and take them down. Several people asked why we don't use a downhaul for the hank on. We have in the past. Um, uh, maybe it's just the way I've rigged it up or that our sails aren't really configured for it, but it tends to bind up and it actually makes it harder to get the sail down. Um, but in conditions like this, we don't even need it because it's not blowing right. strong. It comes down really easy. Right. You only really need it in really, really heavy winds. I think if the sails had an extra section to have that line go all the way to the head, then it would work. I'm beginning to think that we need a book of birds for the boat. We always seem to feed them the wrong things. Well, you know, <laughs> we feed them what we have on hand. We don't have like cereal or bread or any of that stuff, so. <laughs> I feel bad for this little guy because. He's like, what the hell are you giving me? We thought he was maybe a, a sparrow, but turns out he is a barn swallow, I guess, from some of the commoners, and that he actually prefers nuts and seeds and things like that. Which, I'm just wondering, why are they on the boats? Why do they land on the boats? I think they're just looking for a rest. Or Some, handouts. Yeah. Someone had mentioned that the smaller birds will actually get blown out to oh, sea yeah. if there's a strong storm or something. Yeah. And um, I don't think they can land in the water. They'll drown. Yeah, these little guys. Yeah. I had actually started kind of doing a little bit of research on why do they land on boats, but ended up on a website called Birds on Boats, I think. And it was a guy who was doing research on why they landed or what happens when they did land. And then I started reading about the instances where a predator bird would land on with another bird and that bird would end up eating the other bird and I stopped reading. <laughs> I would be so sad. The circle of life. <laughs> I feel I would feel so bad. Hello. It's amazing because I feel like when they do fly away they end up coming back. I don't know if they're going to search for something other than salami. But they're not gonna find seeds on the water, I don't think. Take what you can get. More than once have we had a bird on board and actually going across Jamaica we had one sleep in the cabin for two days. So it's nice to have a little change up. I named this one Shelly, Shelly O'Shea. And somebody said it stood for SOS. <laughs> I'm like, oh, mm, good point. If you don't like sunsets, don't go offshore sailing. Because you <laughs> Said get... no one ever. <laughs> Because we got some pretty epic ones. Actually, we get a lot of epic ones, yeah. I think. It's always nice, though, when the wind isn't super strong, so you can fly the drone at night. Yeah, and we can sit out on deck and enjoy it. I have to say I'm very grateful each time that we get to sit out together and watch the sunset because our first three years of sailing, we did not have an autopilot, and unless we were able to balance the boat, we couldn't do things like that. So, even though he's noisy as all get out, I still appreciate him. <laughs> we do need to consider upgrading, yeah. maybe getting a ram driven or even um, wind vane would a be wind amazing. Vane. These far, far away shots still blow my mind on how teeny tiny we look in the ocean. It's and, such a good shot. And it's not even 
that far a away. A fraction <laughs> of, yeah, how far we are actually from everything. Yeah. So if you guys think I'm the Snow White, Bo is the real Snow White. <laughs> we had a ton of birds on this trip. Now I can't I think believe it, this guy let you hold him, though. He, he didn't fly away. He gave zero Fs about <laughs> anything. I think he was so dead tired that he just... He was so grateful to be on that head sail. Oh. You had gone up there to raise it, right? Yeah, I was up there to raise it. And thankfully, I looked down and saw him. Because, oh, no. Yeah, I would have, uh, he would have went flying. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, Shelly O'Shea was still back here, too, sleeping. So, you know, we had the Airbnb going. And he stayed there all night. He did, he? all yeah. night. I had to clean up poop in the morning, but, you know. It's okay. It's part of the service. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One thing we've learned is to go with the flow and adapt and not push. In that the beginning of our career, we would make a plan and we thought that that was the plan and we had to follow that plan. And we'd stress out about it and we'd get ourselves into situations that we could have avoided. So with this, being so close to the States, we saw a north one coming in, and after doing all this boat work, we felt like, you know what, let's not push her past her limits. We were just going to go ahead and seek shelter. We had the time. Our friends were actually in the anchorage, so it was kind of a win-win. And we've heard a lot of people talk about uh, Hatteras, Cape Hatteras and how bad it can get there, especially when in unfavorable conditions. Like the north wind. <laughs> yeah, exactly, like the north wind. So we, we made the right decision and decided to tuck in to Ocracoke. Remember how Bo said we normally fish in the morning, sometimes before 10? Um, it was just at 10, and I was just about to pull up the reel and saw a bunch of fish jumping, and boom. Our reel went off. It was awesome. <laughs> and finally, it wasn't a bonito. <laughs> tuna, tuna. Yeah, it was. It was a big tuna. Probably a, the biggest tuna that we've caught. Perhaps. No, the one off of Saint Croix was bigger. Oh, that got sharked. That got sharked. Well, then technically, this one's bigger because we we got more we meat got the out full of it. Thing. Yeah. True. So typically when we catch a fish, I clean off the deck, Bo starts reeling it in, I get everything ready, the hook, what's that called? Gaff. The gaff, um, and Bo reels it in. Now you'll see we have to take it out of the holder, holder and bring it around the- Our monkey bars. Yeah. I hold it up front because we actually have it on a lead. Basically line that leads to the planer. Which is what I'm pulling in right now. And then the planer has an additional line where the lure hooks to, and that's an additional 60 feet. And by using that line with the planer, we land so many more fish. And all that info was thanks to Mike, <laughs> <laughs> our fisherman friend. You would think that it's actually hard to pull up a fish with that thing. The yo-yo? It really isn't, right? Yeah, the yo-yo actually makes it really easy. The only bad thing about it is it can unspool really quick if you're not paying attention to how you're holding it. Okay, where do you mean? Which I get a lecture on every time he passes it to me. Well, yeah, I just, I just know how easily it happens to me, so I just mm -hmm. want to make sure that mm -hmm. it doesn't happen to you. I was... So happy we finally got a tuna. This is why we weren't keeping the Bonito, because we knew we only had a limited amount of freezer space, because we had made all those meals prior to leaving, that we only wanted to keep the, the fish that we enjoy. We, we enjoy. Yeah. I mean, we could eat Bonito, but we're not starving. So, actually, was it, was it that, that big? It was big. Oh, yeah, he's, yeah. he's about as... He was a 10 pounder. It was funny because we were like, how, how much do you think he weighs? And all I could think of was what my hand weights and how much they weighed. And I think you said five pounds in the beginning. And I'm like, no, no, no way. <laughs> we should get a fish scale. So we we're not guessing. Oh my gosh. Um, for sure. Woo -hoo! Tuna. 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 T
tuna tacos for dinner. We have this gigantic box of games that we packed before we left Florida. We used to be big in games yeah. when we were on land. But rarely do we get a chance to do it now. So that's why I love being offshore because it gives us a chance to slow down and just do small things like this, like well, reading or playing games. Even that's kind of rare to play games because typically it's not this calm of a sea oh, state. No. So, yeah, pieces end up flying everywhere if it's rough. Mm -mm. We're playing Boggle right now, and Bo loves spelling games. I am horrible at, like, word games and stuff, so Brandy, <laughs> she really enjoys kicking my ass at that. Well, but then we play some Battleship, battleship which I find very funny <laughs> to play Battleship on a boat. Right. The boat always murders me in battleship. Well, we don't have, you know, battle sail sh sailboats, so... Oh, do you think there's something like that? I don't know. You know how Monopoly and Scrabble and them change different types of boards? Ooh. Having game time or together time is really rare. I mean, unless we're eating... You, you guys see most of the time of us together because that's when we're filming. Rarely are we filming just by ourselves because it's kind of, what do we film? Yeah. We're just, you know, sitting there. S yeah, <laughs> sitting back and enjoying out sailing. Yeah. I mean, we could film eight hours of us staring at the water if you guys want us to. <laughs> but this is the times that I really enjoy because we can't be focused on anything else. Our phones don't work. So there's no internet. We're only connected to the Iridium Go, so we have none, no satellite capabilities of eating up data. So it's nice. That one-on-one -on -one right, connected time. time to drop the sales A tuna poke bowl. We love tuna uh, so much strong. that we make it's sure we are stocked to the nines with sesame seed, nori, and wasabi. We should get some ginger paste. Ooh, that would be good. Or something. Yeah. Just chill out. I mean, most times we do carry ginger. It's kind of easy to carry as a staple. Now, we had to drop all our sails because we had no wind, as you can see. Zero waves, nothing. And if we had a diesel motor, would we have kept motoring? Yes. But since we have electric, we didn't because we needed power to get into Ocracoke Inlet. Yep. And if we, you know, if we motored past all this, we would have... Never got the best night... Ever. <laughs> it was just breathtaking. The sunset with the dolphins. It was yeah. so hard to capture all of it because they were just everywhere. And they left and then they came back. Bo was able to get up the drone and get some amazing shots. It just is one of those times that you are grateful for where you're at and what you're what you're doing. I don't I don't even know how to explain it. it it's the epitome of stop and smell the roses. Very true. Because... I mean, look at these. Look at this. I, I can't even. <laughs> yeah, this is my favorite <laughs> shot out of the whole shebang. And I could tell because he was telling everybody about it. Where is it? Did it already happen? Where is it? Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> you guys all know how much I love dolphins, but I think Bo really enjoyed this encounter. Yeah, this is definitely my favorite dolphin encounter <sighs> out of the water. I mean, just amazing. Being able to relive this while we're editing it, editing it and sharing it with you guys is just, it's the cherry on the top. Did you get the shot? I got the shot. <laughs> so when we saw Ocracoke Inlet as an option, we said, all right, let's just go into Ocracoke. Yeah, there was a little channel that looked like we could get through it, especially since we only draft 3.9. But we do s update so our patrons through our, our Iridium satellite, and a couple of them mentioned 
it's a little bit of a dangerous inlet. <laughs> and by dangerous, if the sea state and the weather isn't right, then it would probably wouldn't have been passable for us. Right. But because it was pretty calm, we um, attempted it. Well, we also got really lucky because it was high tide and the Army Corps of Engineers had just done a survey of the depths in that area. So we had some waypoints, we crossed our fingers, and we also know that it's mostly sand there. Worst case scenario, we get stuck in sand. Not that we want to do that, but it was pretty nerve wracking to say the least. And we thought, okay, well, if Bo raises the drone, we can kind of see what the landscape or underwater might look at like because it was pretty clear water. Uh, and that wasn't the case. <laughs> I got the drone up and because of just the lighting and all that, it, there was too much of a reflection in the lens for me to see real time. Had I taken the had I landed the drone and then taken the card out and, and reviewed it on a computer downstairs, then I probably could have been able to, to see it a little bit better. But it just, it wasn't feasible from like the live perspective. Or if you had the glasses that you could oh, see, yeah. like the VR glasses. VR glasses probably would have helped a lot. But we were, once again, slow and steady <laughs> wins the race, but it was pretty... Um, it was nerve-wracking when we got to the part where it seemed like the currents were um, opposing meeting. each other. Yeah, opposing. Which you can see just in the... <laughs> yeah, where that ripple is. Somebody said you kept calling out the numbers of the depth and it was making them super anxious. But for me, it helps calm my nerves so I know I'm going the right direction. And if he called out a number I was uncomfortable with, I go right back around and follow the exit out. Yeah, our um, our Garmin is inside our cabin. So Brandy can't see it without leaning over our helm. So just to make things easier, I was sitting there calling it out. Mm -hmm. And I was just really focused in on following the waypoints, which... Now that we see above the water... It wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad, but I do think that that line that we showed, we should have followed that. Yeah, just that, to the port of the boat, if we would have gone just before where those waves were hitting. That was probably the, the path. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we, we made it. We did well. Actually, we didn't see anything less than four feet under the keel. No, I thought it was two. Was it four? No, it was four. Yeah. Yeah, so... We, um, that wasn't actually that bad at all. Yeah. It was just more of the hype that scared us I more than anything. So. Oh, and fun fact, this is the entrance that Blackbeard took. Oh, yeah, he used to bring his ship in and out of here all the time. And they used this area because it was so shallow so they could have people wreck, I guess, and steal their treasure. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the history. I don't it, know. But yeah. But, oh. Ocracoke, that's where Blackbeard kind of staked. And I think that was his last stand. That's where he passed away, got killed. Yeah, I think it was in yeah. Ocracoke. Yeah. Oh, it's so crazy looking back at it. My stomach actually has a little bit of knots in it looking at this frame right now. So the dark green, <laughs> the moment we hid over that, a, a sigh of relief waved over me. So we made it through, as you see. Um, we go into the anchorage here in Silver Lake in Ocracoke. However, we're not gonna show all of that because this video commentary would be three and a half hours long if we did that. So if you wanna check out that episode, be sure to check the link in the description below. Our life is dictated by the wind. So when we came into Ocracoke, we were avoiding the north wind and now we're leaving Ocracoke because we're trying to avoid this spinny thing called hurricane. Coming from the south. <laughs> Coming from the south. Another thing, we were trying to leave really early because we wanted to, one, avoid the ferries that run through the narrow channel to get out to the sound. And two, we wanted to time the Oregon Inlet uh, for the outgoing tide. So we had a big section of the Palmetto Sound. Yep. 
to get to from Oregon Inlet. And then come to find out, Oregon Inlet is also very <laughs> tricky to get out of. But thankfully, the Army Corps of Engineers had just redone that whole area. Once we got out into the channel toward the sound, I have to say that this was probably the most gorgeous sunrise we've ever had. There were birds just everywhere. Were they all pelicans? No, uh, th just a lot of sea different seabirds. It was just one gigantic island full of them, and you, you couldn't see pretty much any of the sand, and they were just standing on the sandbar. But the sunrise with the reflection in the water was so pretty. And you could just hear the birds. They were so loud. It was actually pretty difficult flying the drone not to hit any of the birds. They were just all over in the air and on land. We actually had someone comment on this um, video because they said, oh, it looks like Bird Shit Island. <laughs> so I guess they're from the area, but it was, it was a really cool experience. We'd actually never done that before, been that close to a an like island, island birds. with birds and yeah. the sunrise and it just was all very surreal s beautiful and serene serene yeah that's a good word for it it's times like this that i have to sit back and be grateful for when we get pushed into a different direction and outside of our plans that if we had not gone into Ocracoke and needed to go up the sound, we would have never experienced this beautiful sunrise and all of nature just having a heyday in the morning. It was just one of those times that you get to sit back and relax and spend a little bit of time enjoying what we're doing out here. It was nice that we could use the sound to actually keep going north instead of having to backtrack out through, through the Ocracoke Inlet. Instead, we went through the sound, which I didn't realize how big it was. It was super fun to sail in. With no waves and just all the wind, because the wind picked up a lot. It was super fun. And it was like almost racing through um, when a race course sets up, you know, the little buoys oh, markers, and markers. Yeah. It was so windy to get through the channel out the, the inlet part. that... It almost felt like I was racing Sersha. Right the Oregon Inlet had just been redone, what, a year ago? Something along that line. It's recently by the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, and they put in new markers, they did dredging. They took a bridge out. And we had a nice map that told us where all the buoys should, should be. And they all were there. They were marked really well. It, I do remember it being challenging getting right through the channel to get to to the inlet uh, just because of the wind direction and how windy that channel was we had to point directly into the mm -hmm. wind remember yeah and it was really shallow in a couple of areas yeah and it was gusty too yeah and skinny <laughs> yeah it's not we don't want to take any risks so we're just gonna motor through it Okay. Sailing out underneath the bridge was like, I don't know, these parts are just interesting because we don't do a lot of sailing in inland areas. So the bridges are always fascinating to me, especially seeing it from a bird's eye view. And yeah, people, the drone. Yeah, people were saying, oh, I've driven on that bridge. Or actually, a couple of people had mentioned how dangerous. Oregon Inlet is and that they wouldn't do it or that they've had really bad times just outside of the inlet. Which so. I can imagine if you're in that area during the wrong weather, uh, it looks like it. the waves... The waves here were really strong. Yeah, but the waves at the inlet towards the ocean side, they looked pretty gnarly. So and it, it was pretty calm. It was and, very calm that day. And the fact that we had the wind kind of on our backs going out. Mm -hmm. I I wouldn't imagine what it's like if it's, you know, whipped up from the from the other direction. Right. I feel like we got really lucky going out with this inlet and coming into uh, Ocracoke earlier that week. And we still had so many more miles to go. 
And knowing that we had now a hurricane formed and heading for sure up the coast, we thought that would be best to stay along the coast, hug the coast a little bit, because in case we needed to duck in, we had that opportunity, which was a really good benefit of traveling the eastern coast. Unlike traveling internationally, it's way easier to to tuck in on the east coast because you don't have to worry about customs and checking in all that stuff it's just you you pop in you go to the grocery store and you pop out whereas uh going country to country it gets a little little more complicated it's funny that you say that i didn't even think about how far it took us to get from puerto rico to grenada and all of those islands in between was less than a thousand miles yeah, it was actually half of them. It was like 600 maybe yeah, or 500. 600. And if we had just rid- rode that coast of the island chain, we would have had to check in every time we stopped. Well, if we got off the boat. Right. You, you can, you know, tuck in, stay on anchor for a couple of days. Are you diving? Another confusing thing about the Oregon Inlet is that there used to be two bridges and people confuse the new bridge with the old bridge. Um, The old bridge isn't there anymore and it was a lot shorter than this new bridge. This new bridge is what, 65 feet? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people get that information off an avionics, which they haven't updated yet. It still shows that it's there. Sometimes we like to use the backstay as just Somewhere where we can hank on our smallest sail and then fold it up. It's just easier to manage. What a gorgeous sunset. We're gonna have fair weather and no issues. Or so we thought. But at least we had a little bit of time to rest up and enjoy this beautiful sunset. <laughs> yeah, because what? It was this night that. Yeah, it, it all went down. <laughs> yeah. And just when Bo thought we were going to have a beautiful sail all the way up to Rhode Island to finish off our sail north, all hell breaks loose. Well, just one. Why is it going to be just me? You You said it was going to be a nice trip. I was hoping. It's all your fault. (laughs) If you guys are unfamiliar with this episode or what happened... Basically, our four-stay uh, wire started to unravel. It broke at one of the strands. And by that, I mean the wire that makes up the four-stay is a 19 by 1 wire. So there's little wires that make up a big wire. Are there 19 of them? There's 19. Yep. <laughs> and the 19 by 1 is just the configuration that it's they kind of get joined together. together. Mm-hmm. Um, Interesting. But thankfully, it was just one wire. Well, actually, it ended up being two, but at the time, we thought it was just one wire that had broke. But picture this. It's the middle of the night, obviously. Midnight. That's when everything happens. And we saw that a storm was approaching, so I called Bo up to change out sails. Actually, just to drop the sail. Oh, yeah, which just to drop did. it. The storm passed. Oh, right. It's with, the next... Yeah, with, like, just a little bit of rain, no wind. So we got lucky And there. he was so not happy because I had to wake him up in order to do so. Yeah, I was a little grumpy, and grumpy pants. <laughs> like I said, it always happens when he goes to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? The halyard that got wrapped around the wire, right? Mm-hmm. We couldn't get the sail all the way down because of the halyard. Right. Um, And that's how we found out about it. Thankfully, we did find out about it. Um, Could we have kept going and been okay? Probably. Was it worth risking it? No. So we decided to then tuck into, uh, what, Ocean City. Mm -hmm. Ocean City, Maryland. Our first thought was to try to get into the Chesapeake, but 
after going that course for an hour or two, we were just getting nowhere. We were beating into the wind. The waves were against us. It was not a pleasant trip. So we thought, let's do a little bit more of a beam reach and go into Ocean City, Maryland. And that's when our trusty electric motor helped us out. Uh, yeah, the range isn't there, but she, you know, we, we never worry about her firing up. She always works. But we did have to run old blue, our generator. Come to find out, we will be using the generator quite a bit going this route. And we never really experienced that down in the Caribbean because you always have trade winds. It's, yeah, it's different sailing yeah, up in the northeast. Seven, but it was gonna take us yes, long a lot different. Of the wind and all Especially that. when you're on a schedule and you have to be somewhere and you can't wait around for wind or weather. Uh, it was frustrating, to say the least, how much of the generator we had to run. Which was fine because we were still able to keep up with being in the Gulf Stream and the motor running and with our mainsail up. We were fine. And if you guys have followed us for a while, us going three knots is nothing new. Yeah, we're very patient <laughs> sailors. We know a lot of you guys want us to get there immediately, <laughs> uh, but we take our time with everything. And, and it's not as though we don't appreciate diesel. That was never the issue of why did we go electric? Why didn't we get a diesel? I get very sick and nauseous smelling diesel. That was the biggest reason yeah. that you that we didn't. And it was a lot less expensive well, to put an yeah, <laughs> electric boat motor in our boat. Because, Those were the two big things. Yeah. <laughs> I really think that the electric motor going in the boat was more so cost-wise than Brandy finding it very nauseating to be in a diesel. Now that I have more experience with people who have have diesels and run diesel motors, it's a lot different than what I was experiencing prior to our own experience sailing. But you did get nauseous still I did. on those, I have, those actually. trips. Yeah. I think in order to negate the fact that we run the generator, in the future we've now discussed, and I think it was just always kind of on the table since we've been sailing and know it's a thing, I don't know if you knew it was a thing. I didn't know it was a thing. But having an inboard generator diesel, diesel generator. Yeah, I, of course. I knew it was a thing. I just, um, on Sersha, we don't really have the space. We'd have mm -hmm. to create the space. Uh, it could be done, but it wouldn't be that big of a generator. Right. And I think to do it the way I'd like to do it, we would want a bigger generator. Mm -hmm. We're just off the Virginia coast. So the moral of the story I is, never personally, so I wouldn't recommend someone who is on a schedule probably at least 40 miles off sail the, the northeast everywhere. And with an electric boat. Fly, like, How about you? Flies. Yeah, agreed. It, it can be done, so and it depends on what type of sailor you are. Many people have done it. We did it. Yeah. It's just we had to use a generator. I've yeah. probably... At least, at least this thousand nautical not mile not sail, not we had a motor. Our last very long passage, we didn't even have a motor. Which brings up something that you guys have really said in the comments is, oh, why don't you take that 20 horse and mount it to the transom of Sersha? Funny enough, when we were in the boatyard way back when, our first boatyard experience, that was an idea, and I kicked it around with some of the old salts there and they were saying it's actually a bad idea with ocean sailing because if you get in any kind of sea state that the prop is going to be bouncing in and out of the water um, even if you can get it low enough uh, it's still likely to bounce in and out and you're going to get a lot of water up on the the motor area so yeah it could be done would it work it would work okay i just don't think it's worth doing yeah i mean we have a motor so being able to use that motor is fine yeah i mean we've tied side tied as well before if we needed to but in this sort of instance we just wouldn't have made the schedule thank goodness the emergency wasn't so much of an emergency that we couldn't have made it but we have our electric motors. I think we were fine.
Yeah, all reality, if it was uh, really, really bad, we could have secured the um, force day right where we were mm -hmm. and done the repair right then and yeah. there. It just, it didn't make sense. That seemed more risky um, being that the ocean state wasn't that calm. So because it wasn't so bad, it gave us the opportunity to, to tuck in somewhere calm. However, we won't be showing you because it's kind of a part of the anchorage and we're just trying to keep it to our ocean sailing. When I fix the force day, I have to go up the mast and it is super rocky and rolly because it's a holiday weekend when we do it. Yeah. I probably could have done it on the ocean, to be honest. Yeah, it probably would have been calmer, actually. <laughs> Just when we thought that going in Ocracoke Inlet was going to be bad, or even going out of Oregon Inlet was going to be bad, our trip into Ocean City, Maryland, was a very tricky one. It was midnight, and we caught the outgoing tide. Yeah, I timed that one wrong. But there's also a lot of shoaling that happens south of the inlet, and that's the direction we were coming from. Um, you kind of cut the corner a little, little too soon. Soon, yeah. So it got rocky, rolly. It got real rough. And I was dropping sails at the same time, so I was literally holding on for dear life on the boom trying to drop the main sail i'm like screaming at brandy so the tensions were high and my heartbeat was racing so by the time we made it to the inlet i was already pretty spent <laughs> going in at midnight with all of the lights on shore and the red and green lights going in it's very hard to decipher a further distance away once you get closer to something it makes it easier but Never have we experienced so many lights with the inlet marklers. Yeah, yeah, the onshore light. Speaking of, somebody mentioned that one time they were going into an inlet and the homeowners on the ocean side thought that it was a great idea to add green and red Christmas decorations on the outside of their porch, which if you're not a sailor, it wouldn't you wouldn't think anything of it. It's just Christmas lights. But just... A friendly reminder to everybody out there who live on the coast of an inlet. <laughs> yeah. Keep us in mind. It is very difficult to decipher those lights. But thankfully, we had Navionics, so that that alleviates a lot of the stress. Yeah, but we got through it safely. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did a good job Thanks. getting us in there. So an interesting comment came through in this episode and asked, and I don't think they were being rude, they were saying, why is it that Brandy's always the one that helms through the tight situations? And it got me thinking, I don't know, why? Yeah, I don't think it matters, right? The only thing I can think of would be that from the beginning, when we first started sailing, Bo understood how to sail. I had no idea, and I felt the only way I was going to learn is if I did it. I'm very much a learner by doer <laughs> so being in these tight situations it makes me super uncomfortable and I feel like that's pushing me outside of the comfort zone and that's the way that I'm gonna learn so having Bo by my side also makes me very comfortable knowing that he's able to communicate what we need to do where we need to go and he's constantly looking out for the safety aspects of it so it makes me feel like I'm pushing myself to become a better sailor. Yeah. Now to actually get to the repair, the whole reason we went into Ocean City. So our rigging uh, at this point was five years old. And mind you, keep in mind that we had been sailing the Caribbean, and we sail a lot. We've been sailing it for those, pretty much all those five years. From my understanding of research, being down in those latitudes uh, wears your rigging a lot more. And the fact that we do a lot more sailing than 
other cruisers because we don't have the diesel to rely on. Oh yeah, I've never really thought about that. And we're constantly changing out the sails in order to catch any wind we can. Yeah, so there's more wear because of that. And, you know, with hank ons, you have point loading right there at the hanks. That and by raising them and, and lowering them, any kind of salt in the air or salt on the forestay is gonna get pushed into the crevices and whatnot. We got some comments from you guys speculating the material that was used for the force day. I bought it from rigging only and all the research that we've done, they actually test their material that they get in and it comes from Korea, which is the KOS. So it's supposed to be top of the line stuff. So we've ruled that out being the issue. We also looked at all the hanks and none of the hanks had any issues that we could see and with the hanks being brass brass <laughs> then against the steel that's what they're made to do right kind of wear away the brass will wear before the steel right. there's a loss on both ends but it's going to be more loss from the brass we were ecstatic to get out of ocean city it is not set up for cruisers whatsoever there's no place to bring your dinghy and the marina wouldn't let us even pay to bring our dinghy there or yeah, to dock it right and then even getting water the marina wouldn't let us pay for water to fair, fill our jerry cans so but there was a fishing store that <laughs> they were super friendly and they're like yeah just use our hose water <laughs> it was it was difficult but we were Happy that we had a nice haven to do our rigging work, and I highly recommend going on land and checking out Assateague and seeing the horses and going to the boardwalk by land. And if you guys want to see more about that, we do film that, but we're sticking to just the ocean sailing, so be sure to check the, the link in the list below. Prior to leaving, we did a lot of research. I called the Coast Guard. I called CETO. <laughs> Charters, CETO. I called all these different people to get a better understanding of the inlet. We even went out that morning and checked it out at the same tide tables. <laughs> Nobody could really give me a solid answer. Um, they kind of just yesed me to my predictions. And I was like, all right, I guess we just got to go with what yeah. I think. We did have the wind in our favor, so that was nice. Yeah, we waited for a southwest wind which was perfect and we nailed the uh the inlet um it was so calm yeah it was interesting to go out with the daylight and seeing how skinny the area was and how shallow it was from bank to bank but we had no issues leaving with the exception of you know the incoming boats and things and <laughs> the ferries and i do find sometimes that in these sort of situations, you can either be scared or you can have fun with it. And I've been trying to have more and more fun with sailing. Yeah, change, change the emotion to excitement. Right, because I think that a lot of times I can get a little bit more anxious and weary. And I just have to have a little more confidence. Yeah, what's the worst that happens? We sink the boat. Jeez. Sure <laughs> oh, <laughs> We're not trying to do that. No. One thing we don't talk a lot about is just the filming aspects of all of this. This particular situation, we had a lot of wind and it was going over the mic. So there are a few clips that we actually couldn't use because you can't even hear what we're saying. The only thing I think that could have added to this exit would have been putting up the drone. But as you can see, it was windy as all get out. But it's so nice to be able to have these different angles to share with you guys so you can feel more like you're on the boat with us. We want to show the experience, but we also want to share it. Yeah. And I've said this a million times. There's nothing like being out there and experiencing it firsthand. Um yeah it's we hope we do a good job of bringing you guys along with us <laughs> i like this this um, angle of it too so you can really see the bow of the boat just kind of going into the waves and we are at do you think it's time to get new life vests? Uh, the channel the 
Yeah, we've had these <laughs> ever since we left, and they're starting to wear out. I just find them uncomfortable. So if you guys have any suggestions, that would be great. Leave them in the comments because we're looking at a good brand. Um, these are just from West Marine. We tried on Spinlock and Mustang at mm -hmm. the boat show. I like both of them. Yeah, they both have, I guess, different features. But we're... I don't know. We'll see what There's we end up with. Not very many sailboats in this area, so I don't think a lot of them are sailing. In. I have to say, I think we were pretty proud of ourselves we're, on that exit. Yeah, I was a little uh, but, uh, yeah, was, boastful. I guess you could say. <laughs> he kept saying, <laughs> "We did a good job. You did it. We did it." Downwind sailing for the next day, at least. This sunset, though, with seeing the Ferris wheel and all of the boardwalk, was really cool. I really wish there was an easier way to put up our witch scruple. Well, we don't have it set up uh, in a good manner. Our whisker pull track at the front of our mast is actually curved. Like, it, it just over the years, it seems like it's warped. So I think it just needs to all be redone. Yeah, we can't slide the whisker pull all the way up and move it around on the boat easily like most people do. It was on the list of things to do when we had the mast down. It's just we <laughs> ran out of time. It's not something that we use a lot. I want to point out how hard it is to take video of the moon. <laughs> it's so hard because I'm on a moving boat and the, it's just moving everywhere. But back to the whisker pole, we typically don't like putting it at night because if I have to bring it down or if Bo needs to bring it down or switch sides then one of us both of us have to be up doing it and we have a little bit of PTSD from <laughs> our trip to Guatemala from Jamaica we had it up at night oh man and a nasty storm just rolled through real quick Brandy was at the helm of course and the head sail got backed backed so much to, basically what backed means is wind filled it from the front end instead of the opposite from the back end so it was pushing up against all the rigging it was not a good situation no. and we had a preventer on so that made it even harder i mean I'm, i think it made it safer but it was just a bad situation Thankfully, nothing broke and everything was okay. And the further north we got, the colder it got. In preparation of being offshore, I got us very light fally, some Helly Hansen pants and jackets. They came in huge, actually. It was nice to stay dry and somewhat warm. We could put warm clothes underneath them and they helped shed the water off so that the clothes underneath didn't get wet. This is the first time we've ever had quote unquote fallies. I don't even know if you can call these fallies. I think they're just kind of waterproof jacket and pants. But when we left the States. Oh, back in the day? Yeah. Yeah. A guy in the boat yard gave us one oversized yellow jacket from West Marine. Yeah, we joked it was our rubber ducky jacket. <laughs> I was grateful for that because we it did come in huge. Well, you know, even in the Caribbean, when a squall rolls through, the temperature does drop. Mm -hmm. And it gets chilly because you're just not used to that little bit of cold temperature. So it is nice to have. But yeah, we just, I would just, typically it would be me yeah. out there and I'd just get soaked. And, you know, and, the free shower. Yeah, free shower and when the sun came back out, you'd dry out. We didn't have a in the boat shower yet, so it was nice to have a freshwater bath every now and then. Nice little rinse. It had been a minute since we used the whisker pull, so we kind of forgot how to maneuver it and get it do it efficiently basically and so this go around we um <laughs> we struggled that's for sure i think we cut out a good portion of it because it was i back i blew out the sail so it was going around the forest day and, and and we detached it incorrectly and yeah it was it was a mess but it doesn't help having the dinghy in the way either we have to kind of do a 
tucked up and roll over and under the pole and the dinghy is a what an 11 and a half foot no 11 11, 11 and it just takes up the whole entire deck that plus the way we have it stowed on deck it's rubbing up against the hypalon mm -hmm. so it causes leaking and the thing is way past its expiration date anyways mm -hmm. so stowing it this way does not help yeah we're looking at trying to um figure a way to do a different yeah. setup for the dinghy in the future because it's not good for it Ew, we delicious. could do a dinghy davit system but we'd just have to install it design it build and it. spend a lot of money on it yeah and with our solar panel set up back there i think it would make it even more complicated yeah we'd have to probably mount the davits lower so they wouldn't interfere when we tilt the panels um i don't know that that whole solar panel thing is a whole nother discussion well speaking of would we ever want to just do a fix setup you know i i think i'd like an arch and be able to pivot on the arch because my my construction it works but it, it's it can be done better so we would have an arch and two panels that could tilt and the thingy could come off of it i i think so i think we okay. can make something work and i think having two extra panels on top of our bimini would be great yeah or we can just make the bimini out of the solar panels correct However, I still want to have some sort of design underneath. I really like that setup. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. Like um like a a, a false ceiling. or even yeah, like a faux, right? Yeah. A faux ceiling. But actually, I think um having solar panels as the bimini and have it fixed, then we it'd be easier to like maybe install snap buttons and and do a full f more of a full enclosure. Mm -hmm. Would we want to have bifacials on the back? I think it would help. I think it would increase our production. Are any of you guys installing or have installed bifacials? Because we're really looking for some feedback on that because we keep hearing more and more about it. And with our solar panels overhanging our back so much, I think it would actually behoove us to have them. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Dave and Sarah, we've got these nice comfy chairs. They're like recliners. A lot of people were asking where they got them. Uh, West Marine. And it just so happens they were in the perfect shade of teal blue to match the bimini top. It's so crazy. Yeah, they are super comfortable. You had made pads to, to lay down, but we just... These were easier to move around. And to adjust, like we could basically put them at any angle we wanted to to be able to have a backrest yep. yeah they they came in big we use them all the time actually we use them as our recording studio they are surrounding our camera right now in order to speak <laughs> yeah deaden some of the the echo <laughs> all things on a boat have to serve at least two purposes so in order to see if we can go a little bit faster, we're going to put up the main and prevent What would you say your favorite configuration uh, of sailing is will give us a little more speed for us. our sails? Wind's going to die in a little over I don't know. I guess so my favorite would really be on conditions. Island, my favorite conditions happens. would be calm seas beam reach i have to say i really like a wing on wing this is probably one of my favorite configurations i think because it helps balance the boat from rocking back and forth too much it is a pain to set up the most painful setup is my favorite <laughs> <laughs> of course I don't always bring the preventer all the way forward. Um, in really light conditions, I'll just bring it right to the midship cleat. But mostly I will bring it forward. I bring it to a block and then run it all the way back to the cockpit. 
That way, if we do need to release it, it's right there at the cockpit. We don't have to go forward and we can, we can release it really fast. We learned that lesson really early on. Yes, we did. <laughs> do you remember the first time that we did a wing on wing? I think it was leaving Grenada. Was it? Wait, did, we... did we? Because we didn't, did, we didn't have the whisker pulled on. Oh. But yeah. I think we we did do wing on wing without the whisker pole. That actually, yes, I remember that because being behind the helm, it was so stressful because you were trying to keep the head and the main full and no backwinding because then that would just be chaos. Yeah, it was more exhausting, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it was fun to do, but I feel like we spent most of our career just going straight into the wind beating into it and i remember when we got to grenada people saying oh my gosh we had such a great sail they were coming from the Atlant from the med so they were doing a lot of downwind and i was thinking when are we gonna get this lovely downwind wing on wing spinnaker weather and i don't think we really really got a, a good chunk of that until we went across jamaica yeah, when we went west. Yeah. Yeah, just because of the, the, what are those called? The trade winds. What are those called? <laughs> <laughs> We've been gone for so long, we forgot what trade winds are called, you guys. <laughs> this moonrise was straight out of camera, no color added. They were so strong on the red. Why? I think it was just time of year. We, I remember the first time I saw one of these while we were sailing this orangey yellow not white moonrise it was I, right at the horizon though. it was right at the horizon and i swear it was moving around and i thought all right i'm watching my first ufo <laughs> and i almost called Bo up because he was sleeping and i felt like a crazy person when i realized oh it's just the moon <laughs> Just out of curiosity, if you guys sail, when do you kick on your motor? At like what at what speed? You have to maintain a certain speed, or when is that? What is your threshold? Yeah, you can't go below this. Be because for us, clearly, <laughs> we just bob around. Zero is our threshold. <laughs> <laughs> Although I gotta say, we have been turning on our motor a lot sooner than we have in the past. Yeah, this it's, was the most we've ever used our motor. And it's primarily because we were on a schedule. We had to be somewhere at a specific time. So we were, you know, kind of under the gun to, to get there and make sure that we were set. And we were really concerned with the different weather patterns that were happening because we just got hit with another hurricane behind us. There were more hurricanes swarming, so we kind of wanted to get there. It wasn't a dire situation, but we were being more impatient than normal. And the duck kind of enjoyed it. The because, duck? Well, what kind of bird was that? I don't know. It was like a seagull. I don't know. <laughs> duck, seagull, <laughs> seabird, whatever. The bird appreciated us bobbing around for a little bit because... Um, <laughs> I think he got some, he or she got some food out of it. Is there anything down there? They did? Yeah, they were diving under the boat oh, they for were. the fish. They were. That is actually swimming faster than Sersha. <laughs> we, need, we need a drone of this. Literally, this bird is swimming faster. But once a bird starts swimming faster than you, you're pulling out all the stops. We are stubborn. We will do anything and everything in our power not to run the motor. So that means going one knot, two knots. But I remember here we had to put up the main. Well, the main was up and then we tried to put up the 180. That worked for a little bit, mm, like yeah. a couple seconds. <laughs> 
And like we were saying, the whisker pull isn't long enough for the 180. So since it was just bobbing around or flopping around. We tried pulling out the 150. That wasn't working. We even tried raising the main, do a little wing on wing, nothing. <laughs> the wind was just swirling around us. The, the lack of it. Yeah, the lack of it. <laughs> Uh, we couldn't tell well, what the wind it. was predicted to do either because yeah. our iridium go crapped out on us as well. Going. So we had an old grib, but the file wasn't really giving us <laughs> yeah. specifics. So we're probably going to be motoring like this for the next... Eventually, we did get close enough to land to get a cell signal, so then we got an updated weather report. And we weren't supposed to get wind till the next day. I think we ended up motoring all the way through night. Yeah. yeah. Into the morning. What you're not seeing yet is the ridiculous flies that were aggressively attacking us. They were, come to find out, they were deer flies. And we were just blown away at how, how much they hurt. You would think we're an acre, but we're not. We're just in the ocean. <laughs> no one to be seen. I was really hoping that they would go away overnight, but unfortunately they came back in full, absolute force. I don't think they went anywhere. I think they were just sleeping on the boat. They were. They were like lined up on the lifelines, just sleeping away in the sh in, on the dinghy, on the lifelines, in the cockpit. Because we really spent most of the day in the in the side, and we would just peek our heads out every now and then and kill any flies that came inside. Yeah, I remember that. We had to quarantine ourselves. <laughs> they were jerks. We um, got a lot of comments on what we could have tried when we were being attacked. Um, skin so soft, which I think I remember that from way back in the day when my grandmother had it, like the Avon stuff. It wouldn't have worked. I, honestly, nothing would have worked. We had citronella stuff. The only thing that really prevented them from biting us was wearing long sleeve uh, t-shirts and long sleeve short pants. Long but, sleeve shorts. <laughs> and pants. And just killing everyone we could find. The sticky pads worked really well. The sticky really pads bad. worked really well. Slowly converting. They say they're not attracted to white, but they definitely were on, on your shirt. They didn't. They didn't care. Yeah, they, they wanted blood, and that's it. They would bite you through your clothes, through your hair. Like, oh my gosh, they were everywhere. What is that? I don't know. What? Then... We saw this robber fly. Holy we, moly. We had no idea what it was. It looked like a freaking monster. It looked like a little cartoon character. <laughs> Big he was old so eyes. cute. But come to find out, they actually eat other insects, especially the deer flies. Mm, maybe that's... Uh, he definitely was on there for it. We were just so grateful that they did not stick around until we... Once we got into anchor, they... They disappeared, so that was yeah. Good. We killed the rest of them. Yeah, our time in Block Island was amazing. We were able to see our friends Sophie and Ryan. We explored the island. Bo broke his ankle climbing in a tree, <laughs> <laughs> which has mended. It's it's good as good as gold now. <laughs> Um, if you want to see that episode, be sure to ch click in the links below. Um, again, we're just gonna go straight into the ocean. Easy button. Literally hitting the easy button. Once we made it to Block Island, I felt as though we pretty much completed the trip. We did have another 20, 30 miles to get to, to Newport, which was pretty fun. Brandy was downstairs most of the time editing, but I was out helming and there was this guy behind us who's kind of going the same way as us. <laughs> so I made a little race out of it. He makes a race out of everything. Only when the boat is actually going slower than us. <laughs> yeah, it and doesn't... we had a head start on him. Right. It doesn't count if we're losing. 
you know, that would break my uh, my mm. streak. We did get a nice wet ride over, sure. and we were going fast. So we definitely kept ahead of that guy until I think he probably turned a motor on. Yeah, and the squall hit us right at the entrance yeah. of Newport. The funny thing about squalls are you never know what's going to come with them. You don't know if it's going to be strong wind or light wind or who knows. So for me, I always feel the need to reef down or, you know, just be a little bit more secure. No, yeah, it's definitely safer because... But I remember this ep this part where you said, ah, I don't want to do it. You didn't want to do it. You didn't want to reef down because there was no wind at that point. Yeah, because we were losing wind, I was I was just pushing the envelope is all. I was. It's not that I I knew we had to do it. I was just like, all right, let's wait out a, a little bit longer. He's usually not hesitant on doing that. So I was thinking to myself, it's he's still racing this guy in his head. He's still racing this guy. <laughs> I had to make sure we we you know cross the finish line before him because you kept hesitating and you kept looking <laughs> behind us and I'm like we've got to drop the sails we've got or we've got to reef down because I don't want to get Clobbered. blasted yeah. <laughs> but the moment we turned um, or w the moment we did do that I think you said the race was over and we won yeah in my mind <laughs> we won <laughs> going into Newport it was so mucky out that we, I don't know, we're, we're kind of concentrated on getting to the morning ball, so it was hard to take it all in. Yeah, I don't think it came across in the video either because we were attending the boat show, a total boat had invited us, so they actually got us a mooring ball and we don't go to mooring balls very often and at that they've never been reserved or We've never had to go to a specific one, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, we've picked up a mooring ball here or there, but it's always just been public, except for the one that we stayed on in the USVIs. But outside of that, we don't have a ton of experience, and I just kind of laughed at this part where, yeah, it's perfect, it's good, it's good, it's good. All right, you're going to hit it. I got it, I got it. Nope. <laughs> So what happened, what ha happened was, what happened? was charm? I, I had the mooring ball loop in my hand and I threaded the bow line through it, but somehow unthreaded it. <laughs> it was the weirdest thing. So then when I went to like clean it off, it just slipped right out. Outside of this sail, we left here and went through the sound and then went through New York. It was definitely the highlight so be sure to stay tuned for that video that's coming up soon we really appreciate you guys tuning in and listening to us hopefully you guys got something out of it hopefully maybe you learned something about us or sailing and feel free to leave any questions that we didn't answer down in the comments below and we'll get back to you on them thanks for watching guys thanks so much if you guys want to help out this production, then consider becoming a patron. The link is in the description below.